Yeah, I thought you guys didn't have anything to say about Billy Joel. We wouldn't shut up about him. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Listography. It is a very special listography tonight, today, whenever you are watching. Oh, yes, Kramser, it is my pick uh, this week. Usually we collectively decide, maybe we'll pull the audience, whatever. Not this time. This time it's all me. Uh, and I have chosen for you, the viewer, uh, someone I really like, of course. I would not put myself through a massive discography of an artist I did not care for but as you well know today we are celebrating the discography of one william martin joel aka billy joel i'm excited for this i'm i'm a big fan of billy joel i don't know why i i know he's not like some top tier lyricist or songwriter uh critics don't like him ryan hates him Jason, ambivalent at best, uh, but the people, the people love him. He's the fourth highest selling solo artist in uh, American history and, uh, you know, sold 150 million albums worldwide, which is pretty impressive because he only has 12 studio albums. He does have a 13th uh, classical album that he did called Fantasies and Delusions. We're not going to be covering that one. It's sort of out of our we, we don't do classical stuff. We're, we're pop and rock, maybe a little jazz here on Listography. So we're going to be sticking with the 12 pop rock albums of William Joel. Before we begin, your familiarity with Mr. Joel. I first heard about Billy Joel. Um, I was sitting in a living room in New Jersey in 2002 and a car crashed through it. No, I'm kidding. Um, I never listened to any Billy Joel album all the way through. In my life until now, I knew every single song from the radio. You're talking about how his album sales are pretty impressive. I think that's because it's when I was going through, it seems like there's a big hit off of like every album almost until you get to the late 80s. So that's probably why his sales were inflated. So back when you had to have the album to have the song, you know, I feel like that's probably so I'll give him credit for that. He was able to turn out like big radio hits on pretty much every album he put out. But that's it. That's it. 33 top 40 hits, to be exact. Three number ones, which we will discuss in our listography. Jason, your familiarity with uh, Mr. Joel? It's kind of hard to say. I don't think I've ever really like sat down and listened to his albums before, but my dad had a bunch of them, so I know I heard a lot of it growing up. And going through this discography, there wasn't much that was unfamiliar to me. So it's one of those things that, like, Maybe I just absorbed through osmosis or something, but yeah, I don't, I, I'm not like super well versed in that. I've never really done a deep dive, but I feel like I've heard all of it before. Yeah. And I often try to check out albums that at least have a lot of acclaim or praise, you know, like the stranger or whatever, um, but never did because his songs on the radio did not do the job of making me want to get the album. I don't like his hits really at all. So I was at least had my fingers crossed. I was like, maybe I just don't like the hits, but I'll like, you know, the deep cuts on these albums. We'll see. I of all the artists we've done, I think I have more familiarity with his discography than maybe anybody outside of Zeppelin. And I don't know why. I just they're sort of like easy listening. Like it, it doesn't require like a ton of brain power and concentration to listen to them. I just find them very enjoyable. He only has the 12, so it's not like it's super long. None of his albums are more than 40 minutes, really. It's, it's kind of a light, easy, breezy listening experience. I pretty much like every song. Very few that I, I don't enjoy on some level, at least. So this required almost no work on my part. So that was good. Easy, easy week for me. So... Uh, but I am very interested to see how you haters kind of view his discography as a whole and where you place what. Uh, so let's let's begin. Do you want to introduce a bookmark in here? Because you were the first one to bring up brain power. And that's all I'm going to say, because that might come into play later on with my reviews. 
And also, I did not look into what the classic like album ranking is for him. I know The Stranger gets a ton of love. I'm guessing Piano Man does too. We'll see. Who's Jason, why don't you start? For the record, I wouldn't call myself a hater. Even my number 12, the very bottom, my least favorite Billy Joel album, I only go as low as two stars. I mean, that's below average, but it's not what I consider bad. At number 12, I have 1993's River of Dreams. And I just think the songs on this record are so anonymous. Aside from the title track, there's like nothing on this record that really sticks with me. And I think the production's pretty terrible. I mean, even his late 80s records, I prefer the production on those to this. At least those have some kind of character to them. This is just so plain. It kind of reminds me of McCartney's Off the Ground record from the early 90s. Just very, very vanilla just seems like it's made for those kind of like boomer yuppies with a bunch of money driving around in their minivans. And I don't know, there's no grit to it. Nothing to say, nothing going on. I think one song that works okay on this record is Lullaby because it's just piano voice and some strings and it strips away all that terrible, terrible production. So that's fine. I hate the, that like terrible, I don't know if it's a synth or what it is, but it's like a clavinet sound that opens the record really, really bad. And then I hate the really tight cracking snare all over this thing. It's like hammering a nail into my brain. It's terrible. I've talked about that before on the channel. Those 90s snare sounds are pretty bad sometimes. And this is one of the worst I've heard. Well, you said there's no grit on the album. I think it's probably the grittiest one. It's like the most guitar heavy, like loose rocking one, but there's no grit really in the entire catalog um, at all. And that's probably, it's not like you need to have snarl or guitar distortion for it to have grit. There's just like not a lot of backbone in his writing for me at all. My number 12 is going to be The Bridge, which I'm giving one and a half stars to. It's the only one below two stars I'm giving. So, you know, I don't like, I don't, do I hate Billy Joel? Maybe I need to really think about what the word hate means to me. I did like, even though I don't have any one star albums, nothing that's going to be nominated for March Badness or anything. This was a one star experience for me. Didn't hate it as much as doing the Eagles though. So we got that going for it. All right. I feel like by the time he puts out the bridge, you know, he in the 80s stuff earlier, you know, he did like really new wavy stuff with glass houses. And then he's got like the doo-wop album and all of that sort of stuff. This one just seems like an utter hack job, like all over the place, especially right off the bat um, with Run Out on Ice, which is just such a police ripoff to me. And he really, not not just in the music, but it, he literally sounds like he's doing a sting impression when he's singing. The rest of it has like really sappy mid 80s pop on it. Some of his worst writing yet. I like his 80s production with, you know, Glass Houses and Innocent Man, but this is just like really like wannabe bubblegum stuff that doesn't stick. It's also really all over the place. Every song just kind of sounds like a copy of something that he heard on the radio and then kind of went home and learned it and maybe changed it up a little bit. Like there's not a lot of effort into it at all. And I hate like on Modern Woman when he does like that upbeat crowded jargon, like obviously on like we didn't start the fire when he does that doesn't work at all in general i think he should try to be much just quieter and try to bring out whatever soul he has but i think he really overestimates what he can do vocally in his entire catalog this one's got a lot of that um like the high notes he's trying to do on um, big man on mulberry street just terrible um so one and a half stars for me for the bridge terrible that's that's a terrible opinion um the only correct opinion for 12 is going to be Cold Spring Harbor because, of course, they mastered it incorrectly. Uh, it's sped up, so his voice sounds extremely high. It's a little chipmunky. They literally mastered it incorrectly. It actually starts off pretty good. She's got a way, kind of a classic torch song at this point, sort of an American classic. Uh, but the one you hear on the radio is from songs uh, from The Attic, which was live recorded in 1980, uh, which sounds great. Here, I just can't get over his his voice. It's already kind of high in the beginning of his career. He's kind of singing, I don't know, out of his comfort zone, I think. And on this, just the extra speed on the mastering just makes it 
just weird. But I, I do like You Can Make Me Free, Everybody Loves You Now, and Why, Judy, Why. Uh, I think they're good songs. They just sound odd on this production. Pretty 70s. Like, this is 1971, so it's 70s, which I like, and I think if they had done it correctly, there's some good tunes here, but uh, nothing really uh, great on this one. I think he doesn't like it. I don't think anyone really likes this one, but apparently you guys do somehow. Don't know, but uh, yeah, 12 Cold Spring Harbor. Two stars. It's the only one below a three star for me. You are not going to like where I have Cold Spring Harbor. <laughs> um, but we will get to that later. My number 11, I'm kind of seeing eye to eye with Cram. Uh, another two star for me, I have The Bridge. Running on Ice opens with this really like 80s TV drama kind of synth sound really strange. And then it turns into a police song out of nowhere. And yeah, you're totally right about him trying to like sing like Sting. And I actually have that kind of a note written all through his catalog. He's always trying to mimic vocal styles. It's, I mean, I got it too. It's I weird. The same notes. So, so on that track, he's, he sounds like he's trying to sing like Sting. And then on a matter of trust, I have written that he's trying to sound like Robert Palmer. There's all kinds of things like that. It's very just kind of copycat-ish. I think the songs on this record are kind of catchy. At least the first four songs or so, I think, are, are pretty hooky and, and stick in my head, even though the production's really that kind of like heavy-handed 80s production, which kind of ruins it. And then all of a sudden, after those early songs on the record that are kind of fun, kind of catchy, it shifts into like this jazzy bluesy thing with the Ray Charles tune and then a couple other of the tracks. So a little disjointed in that way. I like the track with Cindy Lauper a lot, Coded Silence. I think that's good. It's just a weird record. There's like moments on it that I like, but the production's really bad. And then there's a handful of songs that just kind of kill it. Two stars, The Bridge. I will also be mentioning many, many other artists of the respective albums, contemporary status, because I feel the same way. He's always sounding like somebody else from track to track even. And that'll take me to number 11, two stars for Stormfront. So this one opens with That's Not Her Style. And my immediate thought listening to it was, okay, he's into Robert Palmer now. Um, very kind of cool. All right. Still not great. I'm not even going to mention we didn't start the fire because my head will explode. Never liked that song at all. Can't stand it whatsoever. I kind of like the thin power ballad of like um, Down Eastern Alexa a little bit. And I got to extremes like a decent little pop rock song. But again, I listened to it and I was like, oh, he's really into Eddie Money while he wrote this. <laughs> like, And it also kind of had like the same drum sound as uh, Addicted to Love. I don't hate this album. I think it would have been better suited if When in Rome closed it rather than the And So It Goes kind of piano ballad because it kind of plays more of like a pop rock record. And I don't like that just out of nowhere. He's like, I'll just do an old old standard Billy Joel style bar piano song. Um, so not much for me here at all. Two stars for Stormfront, number 11. That, that 80s or that, that weird production on that one is very odd, but uh, I have it a little higher. I'm going back to the beginning again. I'm pretty much going in order off the bat. I got Piano Man. You guys are totally right. He's always trying to be someone else. He's always singing like someone else on his albums. He's always taking ideas, you know, whether it's doo-wop or early R&B or the Beatles or, you know, whatever the style is or whatever the style was. He's always kind of searching for a sound. He never really has his own. And Piano Man... You know, it's, it's two years after Cold Spring Harbor. He's in L.A. It kind of has that L.A. sound. Like, it's almost that Americana, the band vibe. Like, he's, he's trying with, like, Travel and Prayer. And, you know, the Ballad of Billy the Kid. Like, it, it's kind of, like, half in, half out of Americana. Uh, Piano Man has a lot more sort of that instrumentation with, like, the harmonica. And I think there's a banjo or a fiddle in there. And that's kind of all over the album. And I just don't think that's his sound. Uh, I like Piano Man. I think it's pretty good. I think Stopping Nevada is good. It's, I don't know. There's just something not quite grabbing me yet. And I think the, the instrumentation is a little too ornate. He's relying too much on studio musicians. He doesn't have like his own band yet. So 
He's still trying to kind of find his sound on this one. Yeah, I think he has it with Piano Man, but uh, the rest of the album is not really like that. Uh, so I don't know. It never. I never listen to this one. This in Cold Spring Harbor, I pretty much just skip every time if I'm doing a Billy Joel listen through. So I give it three stars because it's it's interesting. There's a couple tracks. Not my favorite. I usually skip this one. All right. My number 10 is Stormfront from 1989, produced by Mick Jones, the one from Foreigner, not the one from The Clash. Still has very 80s production, but it's not as heavy handed, like super synthy, like the, the bridge it is. It's more just like big rock reverb type of stuff. I like I Go to Extremes. I think that's a good pop song. I don't mind We Didn't Start the Fire. That's not her style. And so it goes, I like a good bit, but uh, the rest of it, there, there's not much on it that really sticks with me. The, all the other songs on it are just completely forgettable, I think. So it's it's fine. It's also two stars for me. All right. My number 10, two stars was one and a half, almost. Um, it's going to be 52nd Street. Um, I think he's just, aside from a handful of songs, just a terrible lyricist. I really do. Most of his songs are just start off with, so and so from dot 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 or blank is doing blank and it's just so pedestrian and you can do that sort of style i mean that's basically what folk music is but that he doesn't put any twist or character or emotion into it at all it's just very just background noise so i feel like 52nd street has a lot of that except for big shot which i think is an interesting piece of lyrics some actual character into it that he just sings terribly and just has like this really awkward, ugly beat behind it. And then with a song like um, Honesty, just trying to do like this rock style that I don't think sounds good. I think Zanzibar and Stiletto are really bad lyrically. The reason why I don't have it um, at one and a half is I think Rosalinda's Eyes is really pretty good and has really cool playing on it. But every, I mean, I don't, this is one of those cases where if you don't like the artist, it's their best examples of what they do is usually your least favorite. So a lot of the big hits, and I'm guessing this is a pretty popular album of his, doesn't do a damn thing for me. Two stars, 52nd Street. You know, the whole point of Joel is that his lyrics are not adorned. There's not a lot of metaphors. It's not a lot of, you know, analogies, similes. It's just straight kind of nice storytelling i love that album and i love his lyrics on that that's way up my list where it belongs i have at my number 10 i got river of dreams his final his you know win the super bowl walk off the field john elway the number one had a number three uh, song with river of dreams a little less cheesy on the production than stormfront stormfront's like super arena rock like garth brooks took shameless and just barely changed it at all and turned it into a massive country hit so it's like in that sort of like awkward 90s arena rock like country pop kind of world which i don't love i, I like it a little bit more than river of dreams just because i think it has some better songs but uh, river of dreams you know great wall of china kind of sounds like tears for fears a little bit He's always, he's always trying something. And maybe that's why, you know, Ron Cranberry hates that. But I like kind of the way he brings in different artists. I like bringing in different stuff too, but he's literally just like... It's, I mean, it's true, but he's also completely upfront about that. Like, he just, on something like An Innocent Man, he's basically just saying, like, in the credits, he lists the artists that he's trying to sound like. So it's not like he's surreptitiously trying to like steal other people he's like i like this i'm gonna sound like this for this and i i think it works i think he's all over the place but i think it works i think river of dreams has some good songs i like the way it ends you know, his final pop song that he ever wrote famous last words which is a perfect way to go out i don't know this is a late 22 years after the you know, the start of his career. He's, he's kind of run out of things to say, let's be honest. So 
there's some decent stuff. I like the River of Dreams. Kind of has a world music vibe to it. Some African chants, stuff like that. And it, I think it sounds good. I don't mind the early '90s production. Like Jason just hates it. So uh, a pleasant listen. Not one of my favorites. I don't listen to it often, but I, I give it three and a half stars. For my number nine, we are bumping up to two and a half stars. I have 1973's Piano Man. And this is one of those records where he's really just like trying on all these different like artists hats. There are a lot of like Elton references on this record musically where he seems to be like blatantly doing some Elton John stuff. There's a lot of stuff that sounds like Harry Nilsson. There's stuff that sounds like the Eagles on it. A lot of California references, a lot of that Laurel Canyon kind of stuff coming through in the sound. Some of the songs are pretty good. There's decent songwriting here, but the delivery of all of it is so like overblown and dramatic and just too, too over the top. A lot of the times he just feels like, I don't know, like a theater kid or something let loose in a rock band. And it's just not that convincing. So it's all right. My favorite song on it's probably Stop in Nevada. I like that song a good bit. I think it's pretty good. There's some other interesting moments. I don't think it's really a bad record. It's just, uh, I don't think he's really found his voice on it yet. I agree. And I probably would have guessed this would have been higher up on Joe's list, Piano Man. Or, and I probably just always assumed it was like a classic Billy Joel album with Piano Man on it. And for some reason, the album cover just always seemed like it was the, like the pinnacle of Billy Joel. Um, but I do have that at number nine. I've got it at two stars. You guys pretty much said everything. I've never liked Piano Man really at all. Really hate the ballad of Billy the Kid. It's so like cheesy. And it sounds like Jason was saying, like overblown and theatrical. It's like an old from like the 50s Disney, like Davy Crockett radio play or something. Like it's just, it's way too cheesy. I don't like, I know he, um, I know he loves orchestral music and classical music. And sometimes when he composes in those manners, like just on the piano with his composition and kind of operates in that vein, it works. But when you just bring in like the stuff in like Ballad of Billy the Kid, like it's just like, it, I have no idea of what's going on really. Um, and then I'm not really digging the Westernness of any of it, but I didn't really hate any of the songs. So I'm going two stars, Piano Man at number nine. Uh, number nine, I got Street Life Serenade. This is an interesting one. Like, I don't think most people even know this is a Billy Joel album. Kind of falls between the cracks of Piano Man and Turnstiles. And this is his last one in L.A. So it still has that L.A. sound. Like there's a bunch of steel guitar like all over this, like banjo, stuff like that. He's really... You can kind of tell he hates Los Angeles, like, a lot. He sounds kind of, like, sick of the whole place. Sounds, he's already, like, super bitter. Like, he's got to be only, like, 24, 25. He's just incredibly bitter. But Los Angelinos, Great Suburban Showdown, Last of the Big Time Spenders, Weekend Song. Like, he, he just kind of feels like he hates everything, which is fine. Like, The Entertainer is kind of a good... Uh, retort to the music industry execs who told him that Piano Man was too long, so they had to cut it down for radio. And I, I you know, I like that. I like the the bitterness. So I think he he sells it well. He sings it well. And there's some good tracks like Street Life Serenader, uh, kind of has a cool sound. I like most of this. Roberta's good. Uh, nothing on here I dislike. Two instrumentals though. Uh, it's pretty short, and it just again it. I'm, I like Billy Joel's New York sound, and this is the LA sound. Uh, so it's just not quite there for me. I still like it though. It's, it's three and a half stars, but he gets better. I think once he goes back to LA, gets his own band, starts becoming that kind of New York classic bar band sound. So not quite there yet, but I still like it. I still listen to this one. All right, my number eight is an innocent man from 1983 2.5 stars this is the record where he does the kind of r&b motown doo-wop throwback and i think he absolutely nails the style of this songwriting i mean these songs sound like they were plucked directly out of the era that he's trying to to mimic and i love a lot of that music so i should in theory like this record a lot because the songs sound like like a it would be a covers album almost but 
I think the, the songs would just be better if they were done by somebody else and if they didn't have 1983 production on them. He's just, again, not that convincing. He's just putting on all these different voices. It doesn't feel authentic or, or real at all. And it's not that he's, you know, taking these styles and, and using them. I've said on the channel before that originality isn't a huge deal to me like it's fine I, there's tons of albums that are kind of genre exercises that I love like Almost Blue by Elvis Costello and, and things like that so it's not an issue that he's taking these styles and, and trying to make a record out of it it's just that I'm really not buying it from him I think that's just a good way to kind of summarize how anytime he tries to connect emotionally I'm just like, I'm not buying it, dude. There's something you're just not being sincere about. But that album, I have much higher. My number eight is going to be two stars for The Stranger, which I would assume is a top tier one. But I don't like any of his hits. Uh, I really don't like moving out at all. I really don't like The Stranger at all. I find it is like rhythm and grooves and like the pocket and the playing on this these songs just really awkward and i absolutely despise scenes from an italian restaurant this is the first time i've ever finished listening to it because i could never get by just a bottle of red bottle of white i was just like it's so lame <laughs> but it is what it is um you know jason just mentioned that it seems like a lot of uh, the lyrics on that one album are just like kind of for like that Eagle style, like yuppie class that have 30 seconds in their commute to feel deep and have uh, some moments and thoughts about their feelings. But that's about it. I don't think anything on this album is really good, except She's Always a Woman is absolutely lovely. It's one of his better compositions, no doubt. It's a tolerable piece of lyrics. I think it's not, I think it's a pretty good song that would be even better if done by someone else but oh yeah and only the good die young never liked that it's, it's rough it was a rough one for me but um yeah like the songs that aren't the big hits i thought were decent on this album which is why i have it higher than the bottom records but yep that's where i got the stranger let the comments fly that's fine two stars my number eight yeah i'm, I'm not gonna comment but i assume or well i don't really trust our commenters to take you to the woodshed for that one like they should but <laughs> I'll, I'll be discussing the stranger much later obviously because i'm not insane number eight i have stormfront unfortunately titled uh hard i don't even want to search on google for this one uh, half the time fortunately it's two words not one i like all these songs i think they're Good songs. I, I think the Down Easter Alexa, it's not something I expect Cramser to like because it's very kind of direct. Not, again, it's not ornate or overly kind of flowery lyrics. It's just very much, hey, I'm a fisherman. There ain't no fish left in the sea. So I might not be a fisherman anymore. But, I, you know, I, I like the directness. I think he takes characters' voices very well. He's, he rarely sings about himself or through himself. He's always kind of taking different characters. Uh, he does that one real well. I really don't like We Didn't Start the Fire. That song always has bugged me. His biggest hit, the one song I don't like. But, uh, you know, a song like Leningrad, where he's a clown that he met in Russia when he was doing concerts over there, turned sort of his story and Billy Joel's own story into a, a nice little song. I just think everything is so catchy. The The production sucks, yes. I wish they would turn down the synth, the arena rock. It just sounds so of that era. And I think the songs would be much better suited with uh, Phil Ramone production instead of Mick Jones. But this is really the first one. This is the first one he did without Phil Ramone since uh, The Stranger. So that kind of that symbiotic relationship between Ramon and Joel is kind of where all the classics came out of. This one doesn't quite have the sound. He's um, has a new band as well for the most part. So I, I like the songwriting a lot. I like all the songs other than Weedons on Fire. But the, the synth is just like, it is a hurricane just assaulting you. And like the drums are super loud. Like everything's just too loud on this one. So songs I like, production I don't. 
and he's kind of nearing the end of his rope. His voice is getting a little ragged, I think, in some cases. But I still think it's pretty good, and I give it four stars. To be clear, I have no problem with direct lyrics, but you've got to back it up with some sort of performance or emote something. He just comes off as so flat to me without any character perspective on, like, almost i mean there are exceptions i mean in my top 10 songs a good bit of them i think are pretty good but yeah that's that's the problem i've got is i'm not buying it like jason said yeah i mean i can see that i can i have no problem with people saying they don't like billy joel because i totally can see why they wouldn't he, he gets me so i love him all right number seven for me is going to be 52nd street uh, we're sticking at a 2.5 for this one. This is kind of a weird record. It's like hit or miss. I, I'm with Cram. I, I do not like the hits on this record, at least the, the big hits, um, big shot in my life. I do, though, like Zanzibar a lot. I like Rosalinda's Eyes a lot as well. But then Half a Mile Away, not so much. This whole record kind of walks the tightrope of... 70s excess and sometimes it does that well and sometimes it like stumbles too far into it into cheese and overproduction and late 70s kind of schmaltziness but you know the, the good moments on it are I think are really good but there's just too many too many clunkers for me that drag it down all right my number seven is going to be river of dreams still two stars though and I'm sure someone in the comments will be like really you like river of dreams more than the stranger what, what do you expect and I don't like Billy Joel's hits what do you want? I'm with Joe. I don't have a problem with the 90s production on this at all. This one seems like he does actually have like some bitterness and emotion right now in some of the lyrics. And I like that there's like for the first time kind of like a loose rock and roll band feel a little bit to it. And I don't think the songs are that great. There seems to be a good bit of guitar at the beginning, um, which is nice. And then um, with the song Blonde Over Blue, Chris Isaac no doubt. But then he's got a bit of a crystal ball because go back and listen to All About Soul and it's Brandon Flowers. I swear to God, it sounds just like Brandon Flowers. So that was kind of cool. Halfway through the album, I'm not really, I'm kind of digging it in a little bit and enjoying the momentum. And then Lullaby comes in just like an old school, kind of boring to me, Billy Joel piano ballad. And then it just never comes back at all. Like any of like the somewhat like rockish stuff in the beginning just abandons it. And it, the rest is kind of totally forgettable, but it is higher of my two star rated albums at number seven, River of Dreams. My number seven is An Innocent Man. It's a good album, real good album, four star album, Uptown Girl. I don't have enough good things to say about Uptown Girl. I could be here all night talking about Uptown Girl. So catchy. One of the most catchy songs ever written. If you don't sing along with it, then there's something wrong with you. You can take the lead. You can take the backup vocals. Either one, you better sing along. I want to sing it right now. I've been listening to it all day. I do like the way he kind of jumps through, you know, Uptown Girl's Frankie Valley. Uh, leave a tender moment alone he's trying Smokey Robinson an innocent man Benny King longest time you know Frankie Lyman and the teenagers and I think he does it all well I think he pretty much nails the the style the arrangements a little sparser I think than I normally like you know I, I like those artists but I don't know if Billy Joel can really pull off that kind of soul you know I'm kind of with you guys when I when I say Joel, like, you know, I like his vocals, but he's not he's not an R&B singer, really. Like he's a bar band, New York style singer. So I think it's a little outside his his comfort range. I do like uh, the way he does his own backup vocals on The Longest Time. And the fact that it's mostly acapella other than a little bit of drums, a little bass. Uh, he's doing the finger snaps. He's doing the claps. I think that's cool. I think he does it really well. I really like R&B and soul and, and that kind of stuff. So he's just not quite at that level to pull it off, but I still think it's a really good album. Uh, and I, I like what he's going for. I like his, his style on this and I love Uptown Girl. So it's a four star album for me. Okay, number six, I've got Turnstiles, another two and a half star album. This is his return to New York album after his first few LA records opens with the song uh, Say Goodbye to Hollywood, 
but he's doing it again. Summer Highland Fall sound. He sounds exactly like Jackson Brown on it. And he's even stealing some of Jackson Brown's phrasing. It's a good song. I like it. Um, but really ripping off uh, Jackson Brown on there. I like James a lot. I love the sound of the electric piano. In general, I, I enjoy electric pianos, but the way it's recorded here, it just sounds fantastic. I think it's great. Probably my favorite on the record, but uh, I don't love the whole record um, or anywhere close to it. Those two tracks stand out and the rest of it doesn't do a lot for me. I also have turnstiles here at two stars, number six. I don't think the writing is very good, but he does seem to have a little bit more like malice, I guess, attitude because he's happy to not be in California. So I'm getting a little bit of that. It's one of definitely one of his more expressive albums, I'd say. I just don't really like many of the songs. I really hate Angry Young Man a lot. I do think there's some nice playing by the band on this album. I think they steal the show, especially like on All You Want to Do is Dance. Say Goodbye to Hollywood's a good opener, but nothing for me really to grip on. I don't care for New York State of Mind. Um, so I kind of agree with Jason. I think the sound's really good, especially the keys, and the playing is pretty good. But again, the writing's not gripping me at all. So still a two-star territory. Number six, Turnstiles. Uh, my number six would be The Bridge. You guys hated it, but I think it's great. Uh, I love Running on Ice. I think it's so weird. I remember the first time I heard this album, I was like, what the, the hell is this? Like, this, this isn't Billy Joel. This isn't doo-wop. A little cheesy sounding on that opening synth because it sort of sounds like a cartoon, like somebody is like scoring a <laughs> Bugs Bunny cartoon with someone running on ice. But I, I think he does the, the Sting uh, impression pretty good. And I, I think it's a really catchy song. So I like it. You know, I like uh, The Code of Silence with Cindy Lauper a lot. I really think Baby Grand, you know, I get where Jason said it's all over the place and it totally is because it goes from like, police new wave to sort of Huey Lewis in the news of modern woman. And then, Oh, here comes a duet with Ray Charles out of nowhere. And then it, you know, keeps in the jazz realm with big man on Mulberry street, which I like a lot. I like that jazzy uh, breakdown. He brought in some real jazz musicians for that. I, I think it's cool. I like the way it's all over the place. It might be this high on my list because I didn't, it was probably like the last one I actually heard. Didn't know this album existed, sort of came out of nowhere. So I probably haven't over listened like maybe some of the other ones, but uh, I think it's good. I think it's a nice sort of bridge between his 60s doo-wop obsession uh, and his jazz obsession and kind of getting back into modern pop. So it's another four star album for me. My number five, this is where we bump up to three stars. <laughs> I've got 1982's Nylon Curtain, which was one of the early adopters of digital recording, and it sounds like it. I don't like the way this sounds very much. I think a lot of his records in the 70s, I think the strength of them is, is the sound of them and the kind of warm 70s production. Totally gone here, which is a bummer because I think these are some of his best songs in his catalog. One of the best set of songs he ever put together. I love Lara. It sounds like he's covering Cheap Trick, covering the Beatles. Um, the harmonies really sound like Cheap Trick a bit. And it's got that very, very um, John Lennon-esque melody on the song. Pressure's pretty cool. She's Right on Time is good. Uh, Scandinavian Skies I like a lot as well. I think it's really cool. Good album. Wish it sounded better. The production on that album doesn't really bother me. My number five is going to be another one. You weren't crazy about the production, but I think it's fine. Is An Innocent Man. Still two stars. I love the James Brownie, Easy Money opener. And then I think Innocent Man is a terrible song and just a bad choice to follow that right up. I dig Longest Time. I do like Uptown Girl. And I know it's an homage to Frankie Valley, but I just hate the accent when he's like, girl, world. I, I get it, but it just doesn't sound good to me. But I think he does do the doo-wop stuff well, for sure. I still, like Jason said, I literally have these notes. I want to hear it done by other singers. And obviously, given the albums that I still have left, this sort of era is my favorite era of Billy Jewel. But just too much stuff. I don't like Christy Lee at all. I think the lyrics are really bad. I really hate keeping the faith a lot. 
And I liked Careless Talk, but I didn't like the yeah, yeah, yeahs in it. So a lot of times I feel like he writes good parts and songs, and then it just takes me like in the worst possible direction. Like I, very few songs I feel like are like a complete good ride for me. Like there can be songs where I could just like be like, I like this pre-chorus or I like this bridge but it's very few far between. So at two stars, number five, Innocent Man. This is brutal. Uh, number five, I got Turnstiles. Uh, another four star, just another great fun record. He's back in New York. He really wants to celebrate that. New York State of Mind might be the most New York song ever written. Underrated. I, I think Joel's pretty underrated as far as a piano player because something like New York State of Mind is just so pretty and like elegant, like just a really nice composition. And he obviously really likes, loves New York. And I, I think that comes through here really, really well on that one. I think Say Goodbye to Hollywood, you know, he's trying for uh, the Ronettes, pretty hardcore with that one. And I think it, it works, you know, it's, so Ronnie Spector later covered it. So whatever the homage was, totally works. I think it's a great song. He's happy to be gone from Hollywood, the place I was born. But I, I can't blame him for that. It was pretty crummy back then. I think the whole album's solid. I think Miami 2017's really cool. Kind of, he has this kind of like proggy kind of feel in the intro and the story, you know, about New York kind of getting blown up and everybody moving to Miami. Just kind of a, a fun song in sort of a morose kind of weird way, but I think it's great. I think Angry Young Man's pretty cool. Like the clipping sort of beat that it has is, is interesting. Another sort of showcase for his piano skills. I don't know, I mean, I just, I don't have too much to say because they're all kind of just good albums, you know. He's he has his own band. He sounds a lot more like sort of a, a bar band. Uh, he has that New York sound, I think, really comes through on this, uh, despite it being, this is before Filler Man, so it's, he produced it himself. So uh, I think it sounds really good. I think on this one, he, he loses a little bit of the bitterness. He's a little more wistful on Summer Highland Falls. All you want to do is dance, New York State of Mind. Like he, he's a little happier, I think, on, on this one. So I, I think it comes to the music and I, I think it's a, just a good album. I will definitely concede something I haven't mentioned. He's definitely a good pianist, no doubt. And I think he does write good parts fairly often. All right, my number four, another three-star album for me, Glass Houses from 1980. This is his so-called new wave album. Another record where I hate the hits, you may be right. And it's still rock and roll to me not good songs. I don't know what it is. I talk about it all the time on the channel of like the radio hits and not liking them that much. And usually it's just that I've heard them so much that they kind of lose their impact or I just get tired of them. But I don't know the, the Billy Joel songs that get played over and over again have gotten to the point where I just, they're nauseating. I just can't stand them. But there's a few exceptions to that. There's a couple of, the, of his hits that I like. Um, but I think a lot of the rest of this record is pretty cool. It's kind of just simple, straight ahead pop rock, most of the record. And I think that's good. He's kind of like not taking as many chances and therefore failing less often. Sometimes a fantasy is good. Don't ask me why. I don't want to be alone. I really like sleeping with the television on. Uh, it reminds me a lot of Utopia. I even had to look to see that to make sure none of those guys were singing on it. I couldn't believe that it wasn't Chasm Salton singing backing vocals on it. So of course I liked it. Yeah, I think that sentiment about like his pop rock phase is just probably the most suited to what he can do. My number four is going to be Street Life Serenade. Um, and I'm going up to two and a half for this one. I thought it was decent, even though I did not like the opening track with like that swallowed vocal sound that he did. Like, why doesn't he just pick a voice and go with it? He does so many different things. And like, I don't think many of them are that good, but I think Roberta is a really good song. I think Souvenir is nice and pretty, but this is the album that what I said before, where I think he would just be suited more if he was just quieter and didn't try to over sing so much. I think that's a big problem that he has. Like he really just overpowers these songs and just doesn't have it. It's not even like he's writing to this emotional level that he can 
reach, like he's trying to reach, but can't like these songs don't need to be sung like this. I think by anybody and like why he thinks he should be the one to do it just doesn't work for me. Don't really dig the entertainer that much musically, but I do kind of like the lyrics. Like Joe was saying, it's kind of a, a shot back about piano man. Uh, I believe someone in the comments made a remark about root beer rag before when we announced that we were doing Billy Joel, but I didn't really mind it that much. I thought it was a delightful little instrumental. Didn't mind it. So yeah, I'm going two and a half for this one. Um, and I kind of like closing with Mexican Connection and rounded it out. I don't know if any of his albums really feel like a great album experience, but this one comes pretty close for me. So two and a half stars, Street Life Serenade. Well, you both said things in the last... Um album review that are correct so i'm going to bring those up i do agree with kramzer that some of his records end weirdly like they seem to like change a little bit and sort of like peter out at the end it's it's kind of weird i've, I've noticed that through all of his albums where i'm like oh okay this is the one this is my favorite and then you get to like the last two songs you're like does this really need to be there uh so yes very trenchant observation there kramzer and Jason, I think you were right about Glass Houses. I do not like, and that, sorry, this is my number four, Glass Houses. I think it's his worst uh, big hits. You may be right. And maybe my least favorite, it's still rock and roll to me. That one I think is just too much. He's trying way too hard in the lyrics there. It's never connected. But like Jason, I like the rest of the album a lot. I really like Sleeping With The Television On. I think that might be his best song. It's certainly up there for me. Uh, I love the backing vocals on that. Yeah, it's another character driven, you know, these are a whole bunch of different characters he's singing about or through. It's not fussy. It's very sort of just classic kind of bar band. I, I think the band sounds really good. I think they always sound really good. But this one, yeah, there's, there's sort of no extra horns there's no like jazzy instrumental breaks or anything to kind of distract from just good old-fashioned rock songs little new wave flavor in it I like the herky-jerky kind of rhythm of all for lena uh, i don't want to be alone sort of fun little story little new wave influence maybe a little elvis costello creeping in there I, you know i just think it's a good good album all the way through if it had better hits if it's traded hits, I think with 52nd Street, it might be my favorite or second favorite, but I just, you may be right. And it's still rock and roll to me. Just kind of kill me. So four and a half stars for my number four class houses. Right, my number three is Street Life Serenade. Probably, I don't know, maybe you guys would have predicted that I would have this pretty high on the list. It's right up my alley. 70s early early to mid 70s kind of laurel canyon sound pretty simple piano storytelling songs with lots of pedal steel and i mean that's a recipe for success if you ask me um i love great suburban showdown i think it's really good there's some weird bad like synth lead sounds on this record here and there and that's got one that uh, i don't it I still like the song a lot, but it's kind of not necessary. Um, and there's a few other spots on the record with kind of weird synth sounds. But overall, I think it's really good. Last of the Big Time Spenders is great. I really like Souvenir a lot. I think it's one of his best sounding records. And overall, I just think it's really good. Not crazy about the fact that it has two instrumentals on it. It seems like a little bit of filler, but maybe another song or two. It could have been maybe my number one or two, but... Overall, I think pretty strong record. All right, my number three, two and a half stars to Cold Spring Harbor. And I would say the strength of this is his youth and inexperience. And this one is the closest he comes to me buying it um, with him being kind of like genuine and writing songs that he wants to write about. Joe's right, he usually uses characters to write his songs. This one has the most first person songwriting in it. A lot of his stuff is just, I feel this, I am this. And it kind of works for me. I'm not in love with any of these songs. I think She's Got Away is great, but again, would probably be better by a um, better singer. I don't think Why Judy Why is good. You Look So Good to Me. Nocturne is nice and pretty. Everybody Loves You Now. So yeah, I think probably has his most soulful, simple writing doesn't sound that great obviously 
but yeah, I think that's the strength of what he's doing at a very young kind of, it's also kind of bashful, which I kind of like, like he's not doing any of that over singing that I have talked about that I don't like. He's really kind of doing the vocal approach that I wish he would have continued, but he really explodes after this. So the album where they didn't even master it correctly. And he sounds like a chipmunk. He's Cramser's third favorite, really Joel. So, and it might be Jason's number one, because I don't think we've even heard it, <laughs> which is just insane. That's insane to me. My number three is going to be 50 Second Street. I like the jazz turn he goes with here. And I really like Big Shot uh, to lead off the album. You know, there's, there's nothing, it's not like Snowblind or something, like, an, you know, the Black Sabbath song. Like, he's just saying, Dom Perignon in your hand, spoon up your nose. Like, he's straightforward about all the cocaine and drugs that's kind of on this one. Uh, Zanzibar is kind of a smarmy little jazz, little Steely Dan influence, obviously, which is why I like it, of course. I just think, you know, the characters on this one are good. Uh, My Life, I always liked. That's one of the big hits I don't mind. Uh, Rosalinda's Eyes is really cool. Half a mile away. I, I kind of like that. I mean, I kind of get you say he's over singing. Sure, he's, you know, really into it. Uh, but I think the band sounds hot on this album. And, uh, you know, I like that sarcastic, cutting kind of mean streak that he shows on Big Shot. And uh, so I just think it's a really good album. It's four and a half stars. It was almost on my 1978 list, not quite. Yeah, I mean, he only made one of my lists for top five. So it's not like he's like my all time favorite or anything. I just think he's very disrespected. I like it. I like it a lot. I like 50 Seconds Read a lot. And it's four and a half stars. My number three. My number two is Cold Spring Harbor. I just think it's a pretty good singer songwriter record. I've got it at three stars. Yeah, they mastered it wrong, but you know who else sped up their tape, Joe? The Beatles. And I went and I listened. There is a corrected version that they released in, I think they released it in the 80s. And I checked that out. He does, I was expecting that version to sound like mid 70s Billy Joel, like much deeper voice. It's marginally lower. I mean, it's just a mostly due to the fact that he was younger and he was singing differently and his voice was higher. But I like it a lot. I, I think it sounds great kind of touches of Emmett Rhodes, Bad Finger, that kind of early 70s singer-songwriter stuff. She's Got Away is a really, really good song. You Can Make Me Free, I like a lot. Falling of the Rain is really good. Uh, Turnaround, I also like. It's a little front-loaded. I think it falls apart a little for me on the back half, which keeps it out of the number one spot. But I think to look down upon it because it was mastered incorrectly, or poorly it's giving a slight to the the songs which i think are really good yeah joe it's a disservice to bill joel no he, he doesn't like it either so I'm, I'm fine with my placement what does he know i don't know he's he's got uh, 150 million albums sold jason he knows a little bit and he made like four different supermodels like he's he's beyond reproach he doesn't need your approval all right my number two is going to be the Nylon Curtain, two and a half stars. Not crazy about Allentown. I do like Laura a pretty good bit. And pre- Pressure has like kind of like a weird, goofy kind of synth line to it. But I think it's kind of cool. Didn't really bother me at all, to be honest. But again, like Allentown is a perfect example where I think it's actually one of his better lyrics, but I'm not buying it with like his upper class, like casualness. Like I'm, this isn't a Springsteen or Neil Young song where I'm just not buying the, the union working line song from him. Laura is really good. Like I said, it's kind of Beatles wannabe, actually probably a lot of Beatles kind of sounding stuff for me on this record. Good Night Saigon has its moments. Um... I'd say it's written kind of too seriously for this album, but it sounds cheesy. So it kind of works in a weird way. I don't really mind it. And the second half doesn't do much for me other than surprises, which I think is a pretty good song. Just missed my top 10. So a pretty strong first half for me and um, a good song on the back half gives it the number two spot at two and a half stars. 
Um, I don't think any of these songs made my top 10, but like if it was a top 15, 11 through 15 would kind of be like the nylon curtain. So that's why it's so strong and nothing that I really despise. So, cause really no hits. I mean, that's kind of my, uh, <laughs> it's kind of my algorithm for a good Billy Joel album or a decent Billy Joel album. When you say, see, you like Bruce Springsteen. You think he really has more middle-class cred than Billy Joel? I know Jason doesn't, so it's interesting. Like I, I kind of find, I don't, I don't find Billy Joel to be upper class or anything. I mean, he's a Brooklyn, born in the Bronx, raised on Long Island. He's got blue collar all over that guy. I'm, I'm really, I'm not saying, saying in general with him. I'm, I'm just saying about that song particularly, but compared to Bruce Springsteen, yeah, I would say Springsteen far more cred. Without a doubt. Uh, anyway, my number two five star album. I forgot that Rumors came out in '77, so I had to kick this off my top five in '77. Uh, the Stranger, of course, five stars. Classic Joel experience here, straight from you know the top with Moving Out, Anthony's song, which I love. I think it's it's just so evocative of like New York, Long Island, sort of. Like I'm watching a 70s movie or a TV show in you know New York City. I think it just matches sort of that time, that era, that space perfectly. Every song on here is you know, pretty much at the peak of his writing powers. Uh, the Stranger is really cool. I love the whistling and then kind of turns into a little hard, harder rock song. Just the way you are is really pretty. I love seeing some Italian restaurant. It's like Billy Joel's Bohemian Rhapsody. It's three songs kind of pieced together by Phil Ramone's orchestration and production. And I think they're all really just super catchy. You can say he's not a good lyricist, but his way with a melody, there's just not a Billy Joel song really that I think isn't catchy in, in some way. Even if you don't like his vocal styling, I think his way with a melody is pretty far up the list. Every track on here, Vienna, I think the lyrics on only the good die young are fantastic. Like just so sort of like, that's what a real kind of, kind of smarmy teenager would really be saying. Like, I just think he inhabits these characters really well. I love, um, you know, the kind of the groove on when a good die young. I think she's always a woman's really nice. He's, you know, he kind of has a sensitive side. He's not misogynistic in any way. I think he writes sort of, maybe not even love songs, but the way he kind of holds up women, I think is ahead of his time, really. Uh, never really takes cheap shots, which I think is admirable. And Get It Right the First Time sounds like the soundtrack to some buddy cop show from the 70s. So I like it. There's, there's not a bad song on here. Everyone's just super melodic, really nicely played. Band sounds great as always. I know people don't like like that ack 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 when you know moving out. I love it. I think it's just something totally different, unique to him. Nobody else does that. He tries kind of these goofy things. Same thing with Big Shot when he dips into the Italian accent. Um, I just think it's it's endearing. It's Corny, but endearing. So unpretentious. So I love it. I love Billy Joel. I love The Stranger. It's a five-star album, but not quite my number one. So one more to go. I, I have no idea what your number ones are. I've lost track. So this is exciting. Mine is The Stranger. I think two things make this my number one. One is that I think it's really consistent. I don't think there's any, like Joe said, I don't think there's any bad songs on it. And the other thing that I like the most about it is the sound of it. It sounds better and bigger than any of his other records. You know, it's easy to make a record sound big with a lot of compression, like River of Dreams and that snare drum just pounding into your head. But this isn't an, a super compressed record. It sounds just really forward. It sounds like it's coming out of the speakers or like the sound is emanating from in front of the speakers rather than back in the speakers. If you just go through record by record and just quickly see which one sounds best. It's this one by far. And the songs are good. Um, it's interesting. I don't really love any of the songs on it, but I think they're all solid, very good songs. It's going to be a rare 
instance of my number one record not having any songs in my top 10 songs but i think it's a deserving number one still three and a half stars for me all right my favorite billy joel album at two and a half stars is going to be glass houses well which probably makes sense because it's the new wave pop rock stuff where i think jason put it best where he said he doesn't have a lot of room to fail when he's doing this yeah all 10 songs i think are decent nothing i dislike I even like It's Still Rock and Roll to Me, and you may be right, probably two of my favorite hits, sometimes a fantasy. Yeah, they're just good little pop rock songs. Some of them are guitar heavy, some are not. Yeah, I got no problem with this album other than I don't like it that much, but I got no beef with it. Um, It's my number one favorite Billy Joel album, Glass Houses, but maybe the worst album cover. No, his album cover, that's, that's fine. It's very literal, again. He's not trying to disguise anything. He's literally throwing a rock at a glass house. On the backside, it's him looking through a broken window. (laughs) Like there's nothing pretentious or hidden about that. What you see is what you get with Mr. Joel. Except he also has 5,000 characters that he sings (laughs) under. Yes, but all those characters like him are unpretentious. And what you see is what you get. My number one, Nylon Curtain, It made my loaded 1982 lists surprise of many. It beat out Thriller and a whole bunch of other classics. I just, I don't know, there's something about this one. The first Billy Joel song I really remember loving was Allentown. I heard it on the radio somewhere. And it just has a really sort of sincere sound. I totally disagree with Kramser. I think it's incredibly sincere, blue collar, if anyone should be singing about the plight of the torn down, dying steel town, Billy Joel edges out Bruce Springsteen on my list. It's consciously Beatles-esque. You know, he went into it again. He does not disguise the fact that he's trying to take certain sounds and certain people's voices and sort of applying it to songs he wants to write. You know, Laura, kind of the counterpoint to John Lennon's mother, maybe Uh, because it's sort of about his mother. Uh, And I think the lyrics are really interesting. He talks about, you know, holding an umbilical uh, cord for so long and sort of taking shots. You know, there's a little bile on this one, pressure. You know, I I like sort of, you know, he drops in a really good baseball analogy where it's, you know, three men on, you have to look inside and see, okay, is the pitcher throwing inside or you have to look inside as the batter to knock it out of the park. I think Good Night Saigon might be the most straightforward plight of the Vietnam soldier. I think it doesn't sound cheesy at all. I think it's incredibly emotional. I think he captures the emotions of it better than any other song about Vietnam that I can think of. The whole, you know, and we said we'd all go down together with the big chorus and the backing vocals, I think is really sort of powerful maybe it's because he is trying to consciously take the beatles you know the mccartney melodicism and sort of the john lennon psychological lyrics where he's trying to probe into minds a little bit you know i just like all of it i think the first half is definitely my favorite half of billy joel of any album between allentown laura pressure and goodnight saigon Inside Two's cool, Scandinavian Skies, you know, about like a bad drug trip, has those big Beatles orchestration come in, a little psychedelic even. And, you know, a couple of love songs, sort of, with She's Right on Time, Room of Our Own, Surprises, sort of, not love, but like domestic sort of life. And I think he does it really well. I think, again, the, the lyrics are very straightforward. You don't have to dig around too much to find their meaning. But uh, I like that. I like the straightforward. I like the characters. And I like sort of the the sadness that permeates this record a little bit, especially on Allentown, kind of starts on a downer and ends with Where's the Orchestra, where it's a guy who goes to the show expecting to see a big symphony and sees some stage play. So it's all about sort of, expectations and how you handle them and life not living up to what you wanted it to be so i think it's a brilliant record five stars my number one the nylon curtain what did win for you in 82 winner in 82 was signals by rush oh yeah 
might have been replaced by the dreaming by Kate Bush. I'm not sure. Give me one second to defend this spring scene blue collar argument. And I know you like spring scene too, Joe. Yeah. I mean, Billy Joel grew up in Oyster Bay and his dad was a classical pianist. And I think Bruce Springsteen had to mow lawns to buy a $12 guitar or something in the window of like his local guitar store or drug store or something. So. All right. Fair enough. Joel was a high school dropout though. And he also boxed on the golden Gloves circuit. So he's gritty, man. He's a gritty guy. He can, he can sing about a failing steel mill town. Fair enough. But it's not just the Allentown stuff. I don't buy anything. No, I, I know. I, <laughs> it's not, again, you know, people say, oh, I hate Billy Joel. And sometimes, you know, when you guys insult My Chemical Romance or Muse, I take offense to that. But I'll Take Billy Joel over both of them any day. <laughs> but I, I can see why people don't like Billy Joel. My dad does not like Billy Joel. I think my mom likes Billy Joel. I don't know if anybody I know likes Billy Joel other than me and 150 million people around the world who bought his albums, whatever. So I don't know. I, I just don't take offense when people are like, oh, Billy Joel, I don't, I don't find him believable or whatever. I think the number one reason why I have like a stigma against him is, and I probably would like him even more, is I can't stand the Elton John comparison where like, why are they playing shows together? I think one is light years better than the other. Like I've had people be like, who do you like more Elton John or Billy Joel? It's like, are you serious? Like, that's like, I never it's like, got that. I like, it's like, I don't get it. It's because they both it. play piano. So they have to be the same. It's, it's a really weird link that they, like I can see maybe a couple Elton John comparisons real early on, but, those those were discarded pretty quickly yeah it's always bothered me because i love elton john he's like a top artist for me and i just don't get it one more thing about billy uh i do really respect the way that he walked away after his 12th album in 93 still making you know number one albums and he just decided that's it that's all he had to say he didn't try to jump back in years later with some crummy cash grab and some failed record with 25 different guest stars and you know rob thomas or something so gotta gotta like him for that went out on his own terms and you know i do love elton john but he elton john has so many bad albums that i just don't listen to for me billy joel's somebody i can listen to pretty much his entire discography and not like cringe ever i think that that kind of helps in my mind yeah he's a, he's a barry sanders he's not a emmett smith well who do you like more i'm just gonna put you on the spot elton or billy uh, i mean the highs of highs elton john is top five for me all time uh, <laughs> so while billy joel has the consistency i love elton john's 1970 to 1975 run is pretty much untouchable in my mind all right so Clearly, Joe is a big Billy Joel fan, and clearly, Cram is not. And that leaves me in the middle, but I think I'm a little bit closer to Cram than I am to Joe. To me, he's an okay songwriter. He's an okay singer. The production on his records, there's a few that I like. Usually, it's in the middle, like just okay. It's just a lot of being just okay that adds up to being less than just okay just kind of meh that's where i that's feel. kind of how i feel i mean i i had one album below two stars but like i feel like when i think about them i'm just like oh i can't think of anyone worse than billy joel but realistically like and a lot of that is the radio hits like literally if you just got the radio hits out i'd be like eh, instead of like Ugh. <laughs> i think that's the difference there's like one rock station here that I don't listen to it often, but it seems like every single time I get in the car, it's Billy Joel. They just really just hammer Billy Joel over and over again. Because he's a beloved uh, artist with hundreds of millions of fans across the globe. Jason, come on, get with it. I, I don't I don't understand people that just want to hear the same songs over and over again. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I'm pretty sick of most of his radio hits, but I still, I still love him, despite the fact that you can hear... Still rock and roll to me 36 times a day. 
And th I think the other problem is he carries over to so many different types of stations. Like he's on the adult contemporary, he's on the rock, he's on the classic rock, he's on the Bob FM 90, you know, so he's, he's all over the place. So again, people say they don't like Billy Joel. They're tired of Billy Joel. That's fine. That does not insult me as a Billy Joel fan. I feel like us Billy Joel fans are pretty kind of, you know, relaxed and okay in our fandom so let's give it up to joe though i'm gonna experience what you just went through next week when we do sonic youth so i mean you're gonna be just tearing it apart so mad mad uh props to you for putting up with you know just waving your flag blindly and proudly that's what you gotta do i can't wait to see joe's reaction to the sonic youth discography i'm really excited i i might call in sick for that one but Back to the Joel at hands. Love to see all of your reactions in the comments. Of course, leave your rankings of the Billy Joel discography. Try and keep the quips and underhanded comments to yourself. We're all about love here on Billy Joel Week. So <laughs> just kidding. You can, if you want to trash Joel, your right ahead comments is where you do that. Like the video. Whether you like Billy Joel or not, check the description for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, subscribe to the channel, of course, hit the bell for notifications, check back tomorrow for our top 10 Billy Joel songs. That's going to be interesting. Jason might have like half of Cold Spring Harbor on there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the hell he comes up with for that one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Listography. Listography.